economic and humanitarian crises, widening gaps between rich and poor, unprecedented climate, demographic, and geopolitical shifts. This is the world we live in. What happens globally affects us all locally. How governments respond to these matters affects us greatly. Policies impact our parents' jobs, productivity, our family's income, and the price of food and services. They can determine whether we will survive, be healthy, educated. Will we have to work to help out at home? Will few of us have plenty when many more have so little? Social and economic policies shape our everyday lives. That is why policy matters for children. UNICEF figured that out a long time ago. In 1947, it asked economist Hans Singer to write about children and economic development. At the time, he didn't see any connection. Then, he heard a lecture on malnutrition and the long-term effects on the development of children. It hit him like a bolt of lightning. Investment in children is not only connected, but central to economic development. Later, Singer showed that low productivity in developing countries was due, in part, to malnutrition in the early years. He realized that economic development is important for children, and that children are important for economic development. By the late 1950s, UNICEF knew that for children to receive the priority they deserve, their needs must be part of the economic plans of their countries. This paved the way for UNICEF's transition from a humanitarian agency to a development agency for children. The 1980s were years of recession and deep cutbacks in public spending in many developing countries. UNICEF's then executive director, Jim Grant, became the leading voice asking for investments in children, advocating that in bad times as well as good, children should have a first call on resources. In recent years, UNICEF has stepped up its work on social and economic policy. A central focus of its efforts is to ensure that public policies give priority to the poorest and most disadvantaged children and families. UNICEF helps governments realize children's rights and meet their obligations under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. For example, in Ecuador, in the aftermath of a major economic crisis in 1999, 1,500 new children fell into poverty each day. UNICEF and its partners worked hard to monitor social expenditure. This led to a 500% increase in public health spending. In turn, 1 million children received meals at school and 5 million women received free maternal care. In Burkina Faso, the global economic crisis threatened to push 250,000 children into poverty. UNICEF analyzed the impact of the economic crisis on child well-being now, social protection has been included as an important response to economic crisis. These examples, and many more, show that now, more than ever, policies matter a great deal for children's lives. When times get tough, families naturally try, as much as they can, to make sure their children's needs are put first. Why should it be different with governments? That is why UNICEF continues to advocate for policies that are equitable, inclusive, and sustainable. It is our right and it makes sense for our societies. Our environments today will shape our well-being tomorrow. Who will we be? How will we shape our world? How will you? UNICEF, Unite for Children.